Thank you for that introduction. Welcome to my smaller audience who is kind enough to join me here in the room today. And certainly thank you to the virtual audience who is out at this virtual meeting. It's such an honor to address practice leaders because what we do is we make decisions. We make decisions individually, we make decisions collectively, we make decisions as a group. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Talk about some foundational principles which inform decision making. And then my challenge to this group is, as this meeting progresses over the next two days, let's critically evaluate these lectures that we hear from these faculty. Let's think about if those foundational principles apply. Let's think about what strategies may have been successful in the past. And let's ask ourselves how those translate to the future. Let's talk about independence. Now, our country was founded on independence. I've had quite a few physicians in the virtual room. There were 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Five of them were physicians. One of them is, is, this, is this gentleman. This is Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush is from Philadelphia. And he tells a story about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And he references these two gentlemen. The sort of more heavyset gentleman is Benjamin Harrison from Virginia. The smaller framed individual is Elbridge Gerry from Massachusetts. And he tells a story how Benjamin Harrison looks over to Elbridge Gerry and says, you know, when we're arrested and hung for treason for what we're about to do, you realize I shall have great advantage over you. And Elbridge Gerry is not sure what he's going to say. And he says, because when I'm hung because of my large frame, I'll die within a matter of minutes. With your small frame, you may hang up there for hours before you die. Elbridge Gary kind of shrugs it off, gives, gives kind of a, a shy grin, but you realize the solemnity of that moment, the seriousness of that moment, what they went through for independence. And we'll translate that independent mindset to our profession shortly. But I also want to talk about a little bit of a dichotomy in that independent spirit, and that's the following. Our country was founded as a corporation. Our country was founded by corporations. Oh, what does that mean? Corporations, corporatization, what does that mean? This is the old church at Jamestown. It's been partially reconstructed. 1603, 30 men settled Jamestown. All 30 of them are employees of the Virginia Company of London. That company was owned by British aristocrats. It had shares, it had profits, it had a lot of what we would think of as a corporate culture. As lovely as Virginia is to visit today, not so much in the early 17th century. A year later, of the 300 individuals who went to Jamestown, only 60, 60 were left. It was difficult for that company to find, for understandable reasons, other citizens to go over there and settle and explore and gather, provide potential wealth for those corporations. So they had to give some inducement, some enticement, if you will. And that was in the form of allowing a charter that enabled them to govern themselves. Around the same time, Massachusetts is founded as a colony. Massachusetts was founded at Plymouth Rock. We know the whole story. But what's interesting about Massachusetts is it was also founded by the Massachusetts Company, a British corporation, employees. And in the same spirit of the governing ability of the Virginia colony, the Massachusetts colony during one of its earliest charters includes the following language. We do hereby for us. There was also language in the original charter, government for the people. And you had to have a charter. If you were going to settle the new world, you had to have approval from the King of England to do so. And that was, that was your charter. It was true in Louisiana with the French government as well. So what is that? We do hereby for us. It's we the people. When the Constitution was generated, these were the founding principles. The Magna Carta was a huge part of that, let's be fair. But that was sort of the roots of the independent spirit that we, face, that we possess today. That was the corporate spirit that we hear today and we're going to discuss later within the context of radiology. So as we think about these founding principles and we think about independence, and we acknowledge sort of a corporate background, and we recognize the importance of democracy. We recognize the importance of individuals having an opinion and the ability to give that opinion safely, to gather, to organize, and bring that forth. 
it's a, they're basic principles. We all know them. We all, we all understand them. But as we walk through some decision points now, let's think about how and where those principles might apply in history, but also how, how they may apply going forward. Let me fully acknowledge something now. You may be having a couple of thoughts. One, you, you might be having a really bad flashback to U.S. history or U.S. civics class. That's one possibility I'll acknowledge. We are going to get to radiology shortly. Um, the other piece you may be wondering if you're in the right conference. Am I in a history conference or am I in a radiology conference? Fair enough. So, so let's transition and, and let's talk now. Let's talk about a few historical points that are specific to radiology. And let's go back to the early 1960s. It's hard to look at historical events through a present lens. So as best as we're able, let's put a past or a current contemporary lens to that period of time. 1960s, healthcare reform is fully under debate and under discussion. It was part of FDR's New Deal. It was discussed in um, Harry Truman's 1950 uh, State of the Union address. So the early 1960s, this is a very active discussion creating what we now know of as the Medicare program. This is LBJ. He did sign this into law in 1965, but let's stay a few years, a few years before that. The discussion, the decisions, and the potential support of the Medicare program were anything but obvious within medicine. It was hugely contentious. In fact, the AMA opposed it. The ACR likewise opposed it for reasons which, 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 which in hindsight and even in, even in present day are certainly understandable. So this is evolving. So the ACR is tr sort of trying to decide what its position is going to be. As it's evolving, the ACR comes to the realization that it's probably going to happen. The speaker of the ACR Council at the time was from Minnesota. He brings in Carl Munt, who was a senator from Minnesota, and he says, you know, this is going to happen. At the same time, the AMA is sort of deciding what it's going to do as far as its opposition. In the original drafts, the original bills, the original plans for Medicare had radiologists paid as part of the hospital. Hospital employees, if you will, but nonetheless, not paid separately the same way what we would think of as a clinically based physician of the time might be. So there are a number of vocal leaders in the ACR came forth and said, we want to be paid separately. We want to be separate from the hospitals. We want to be, hint, hint, independent. So the ACR is in an interesting position because now we, we know or we think that this is going to become real. This is going to pass. Medicare is going to become a real program. We're going to be a part of it. We're either going to be with the hospitals or at the same time, the AMA is coming forward and getting a little criticism, criticism for not supporting the program. So they recommend something called elder care, which was basically the founding or at least the initial framework for Medicare Part A, which is hospital payments. Medicare Part B is physician payments. So the AM, ACR goes to the AMA and says, hey, you know, we, we think this is going to happen. We think we should be paying the physicians. Are you going to support us on this? And the AMA's position at the time, which even in retrospect is completely understandable, the AMA at the time says, yeah, we can't support part of that legislation, part of that bill, with, because we're not supporting the entire effort. We're not supporting the entire initiative, the entire bill. So the ACR realizes they probably need to go out on their own on this. At the same time, the American Hospital Association kind of gets, gets, gets word that this is happening, that the radiologists are going to separate from the hospitals. So they're opposing it. So now think about this, and this is a really, this, this brings together a lot of what I've said thus far. Think, think about, with the present lens of that time, think about what the ACR was doing. The ACR was pursuing their independence. The stakes weren't quite as high as Benjamin Harrison, and Benjamin Russ, and Elbridge Gerry, but they were real. And they're doing it separate from the AMA. They're doing it separate from the American Hospital Association. Oh, and by the way, they're doing it separate from a pretty significant portion of their membership. A pretty significant portion is pretty happy with their hospital contracts, has a pretty good arrangement with the hospitals. Oh, and by the way, has never had to bill for their own services and doesn't have significant experience in doing so. 
you know, those democratic principles. I mean, this is discussed, you know, the representative body for the ACR is the council. For the AMA, it's the House of Delegates. You have representatives coming forward to provide their opinions, to provide their vote, to establish or enable majority decision making. Well, this is one of those decisions where the ACR is, 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 is flexing its independence, is going forward and trying to make a change in, in a really remarkable way. And I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, we, we know in hindsight, we know the outcome. Medicare's being independent has proven to be uh, pretty beneficial for most radiologists and for this profession. From an innovation standpoint, from a payment standpoint, from the ability to contribute to the House of Medicine standpoint. But the risk there was what if we lost? What if we don't win that debate? What if we don't move the initiative forward for radiologists to be treated separately as other physicians rather than hospital employees? The risk was huge. The risk was significant. So the ACR did what we think of now as pretty common. They hired a lobbyist. Most medical organizations with credibility today have some form of an advocacy government effort, a lobbyist, if you will. It was pretty forward thinking at the time. This is JT Rutherford. He was a former congressman from Texas. He was the first lobbyist that the ACR hires. Building consensus, he had a pretty strong relationship with LBJ. By the way, LBJ becomes president in November of 1963 after a very significant event happens in Dallas, the assassination of John Kennedy. And one of Johnson's first initiatives in early 1964 is he's going to make this legislation happen. The other thing you have to remember is in Congress, no one really thought about radiologists. No one really necessarily knew what radiologists do. And certainly no one knew anything about hospital billing and no one knew anything about professional billing. So we've got a lobbyist who's gonna lead this independence fight for us. And what does he do? He helps build a relationship with this person. This is Wilbur Mills. Wilbur Mills is a congressman from the state of Arkansas. At the time, Wilbur Mills is the chair of the hospital, or the um, House Ways and Means Committee. Why this is relevant is because the bills to bring forward Medicare were going to be added to the Social Security Act, which had passed several years before, which meant that those changes were going to basically be a tax, which meant it had to go through the House Ways and Means Committee. It had to be discussed at the committee, it had to come out of committee, whatever the final version that would eventually reach the floor house, the Senate, and progress to the president's desk, had to get through that committee. So there were two radiologists, and if anyone, I actually tried to find both of them. I, I, I hope they're still alive, I, I, I can't confirm that. But there were two, con two radiologists from the state of Arkansas who coincidentally knew Wilbur Mills. They're both named James. One is James Scruggs, the other is James Calhoun. And they get into Wilbur Mills' ear. They say, look, we are not hospital employees. They say, we are not going to be paid by them. We are independent physicians. And another Wilbur named Wilbur Cohen. So Wilbur Cohen at the time was basically one of the drafters of the original Medicare. Wilbur Cohen is what we might think of today as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Didn't have that exact title then, but that was basically, he was the equivalent. So Wilbur Cohen goes into Wilbur Mill's office one morning at the direction of LBJ. And he goes into the office and he's going to convince Wilbur Mills that keeping the radiologist, and by the way, the pathologist and the anesthesiologist were part of that as well. We're gonna treat them separately. That part of the discussion was complicating the bill. It was making it more difficult for LBJ to pass. He wasn't thinking about radiology. He had a bigger picture in mind. So Wilbur, Wilbur Cohen walks in to talk to Wilbur Mills, and Wilbur Mills is sitting with a gentleman, one of the two Jameses. I haven't, been able to, I haven't found a confirmation of which one that is. Um, Wilbur Cohen writes about it in the 20th um, anniversary edition of the Health Financing, uh, or a Health Finance, Financing Journal several years later. But what was happening in that conversation was one of the two Jameses was telling Wilbur Mills exactly what I've already expressed that radiologists are independent, that radiologists are separate, and radiologists needs to be, need to be separated from the program and paid what we now know as Medicare Part B. And Cohen writes that had that person not been there, it's quite possible he could have changed Wilbur Mill's mind, but the fact that that individual was there, one of those two Jameses was there, Wilbur Mills wasn't going to budge. No pun intended, the rest is history. The one thing I wanted to mention about the events I just described with the Medicare program was 
the following is once, once LBJ signed that into law, 1965, once radiology was officially an independent, separately identified specialty separate from the hospitals, it wasn't over. In fact, it wasn't over by any means. A group of the ACR leaders met with Wilbur Mills shortly thereafter to, to thank him, to acknowledge what he had done for the profession. And they were a little surprised by what Wilbur Mills says to the ACR leadership. Wilbur Mills, Wilbur Mills says, we did this, you're going to change your practice patterns, you're going to change your relationships with the hospitals, he says, but you have to convince your members, you need to teach your members, you need to help your members to do that, to change their relationships with the hospitals. Easy said this many 50 plus years later, but at the time it was difficult. Most radiologists weren't experienced in billing for services on their own. Most radiologists were dependent on the hospitals to do what they do, and Wilbur Mills was very direct. He says, if you don't do this, the regulations that are put into place to enforce that law will possibly change, and you may find yourself back where, you, where we talked about from the beginning. So we're in 1965. Radiology is in a challenging position. What does radiology realize? We need to make some new friends. We're going to stay friends with the hospital. We're going to stay friends with each other. But oh, by the way, we need to get and develop relationships with individuals who understand business. You know, MBA types we might term today. And those relationships and that importance of partnering with business professionals to do what we do was largely rooted in that period of time. And most of them came over from hospital billing. They understood how billing at the, the, the time was. Medicare was a little bit easier because it was usual and customary charges. It wasn't CMS 1500 forms and the like that we deal with today. But what it was, was it was new. So those partnerships were formed, and by no coincidence, the founding of the RBMA occurred when? 1968. So we saw the birth of an independent radiology profession. We saw the birth of a new professional discipline, the radiology business manager, CEOs, et cetera, pick a term. And we saw that partnership form, and it's pretty remarkable when you look around this virtual room today, how strong that partnership and how mutually beneficial that partnership has been. So let's stay, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more about some modern, more, more recent events. Because I talked earlier about democracy. I made the point that we recognize majority rule. I made the point that we recognize the minority ability to bring forth their opinion. And importantly, I hope, we recognize that we're not always gonna be on the majority side. And sometimes when we're not, we have to accept that outcome and we have to move forward with what the group decides. So this whole discussion about does the majority have the ability to make a decision? Does the majority have the ability to have that 50.1 or more likely 51% vote carry the day? And so I'm gonna walk through an example that's in more, most of our modern um, remembrance or most of our lifetimes. Unless you're in your 80s, you probably weren't around when Medicare, but most of us were around when something happened in the late 2000s, and that was the Affordable Care Act. So in the Affordable, Affordable Care Act, quite likely the most significant health care reform since Medicare. We can argue the Medicare Access Chip Reauthorization Act. We can argue about macro, but, but I think as far as changing the principles of how health care is delivered, or at least intending to do so, the ACA was pretty significant. So let's go back, and again, we're going to try to look at this with a contemporary lens with the period of time I'm describing. 2009. Okay. Barack Obama is the new president. The election yields 58 Democratic senators. 58. It's a pretty striking number when you think, you know, now it's 50-50 basically. The vice president has the deciding vote, but it's basically a pretty easy, easy, even 50-50 split. Well, in 2009, there were 58 Democrats. Why that's significant is they have the majority in the Senate. So any, any decision, any legislation, anything they wish to pass, they can do so with the majority. But what can't they do? They can't override the filibuster. So the filibuster requires 60 votes to override it. Let's take a step back and let's talk about democracy for a moment. Let's talk parliamentary law and let's think about this from a broader context. If we're a country that believes the majority can make decisions, but we have a body where the majority is not enough, 
where it not, doesn't need to be 51, it needs to be 60. So to what have we enabled? Well, there's a circumstance where if 51 of your 100 members agree with something, then the other side only needs nine, maybe 10, to reverse that. So it's essentially minority rule. And when you think about what we do in our practices, what, what do we do in our practices when we need to make a decision? We want to decide we're going to change the call schedule, or we're going to change from the RBMA side how we manage our billing operations. If we're going to get together and make that decision as a group, we usually let the majority. But what do we do when we have a really important decision? Well, I have a decision that you know, we're going to um, take on a big, a large contract, or we're going to change our bylaws, or dare I say, we're going to um, remove a partner. Well, those are really important decisions, so we're not going to do majority on those. We're going to make it a super majority, 66, 67 votes out of 100, or we're going to make it unanimous. The reality of it is when, when you do that, it's completely understandable why you would do that because the perception and possibly the reality of it is it gives credibility to that decision when you have more in agreement. But the consequence of that also is you're allowing a minority group to hold that opinion, to bring that opinion forth and to carry the day and carry the decision. So let's look at an example where this is significant and bring it to modern times. So again, it's late 2000 or early 2009, Barack Obama's the president, 58 senators are Democrats. A few events happened that year. Two individuals before you, Al Franken. Al Franken wins the recount in Minnesota for their, one of their two senatorial seats. He wins it by 312 votes. That's four votes per county. So now the Democrats have what? They have 59. Arlen Specter from, um, Phil, uh, from Pennsylvania. He leaves the Republican Party. He goes independent, but he caucuses with the Democrats. So now the Democrats have 60 members of the Senate. They can override the filibuster. So any plans, and Barack Obama early in his administration made it very clear that he was going to build, build on Bill Clinton's efforts to bring forth health care reform, insurance reform in particular. And so now he has the 60 votes to do that. The bill passes the House. The bill passes the Senate. The next step was going to be a conference committee to decide what the final legislation looked like. Now we're kind of in mid-2009, fall 2009. So something else happens. Ted Kennedy dies of, 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 a, of a brain tumor. The Massachusetts Senate seat is up for election. Scott Brown wins that seat. That Senate seat in Massachusetts has not been a Republican-held seat since the 1950s. So now we're stuck. So now or the Democrats are stuck. So now you have 59 votes. You no longer can override the filibuster, but you've got these two bills in the House and the Senate which have passed. The Speaker of the House, Pelosi, decides that what they're going to do is they're going to pass the Senate version of the bill. It was called the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. We call it the ACA today. And there were some shortcomings to that bill. Um, there were some challenges with, 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 with some, some aspects of the health insurance exchanges, you know, the tanning tax and some other aspects of it. So they do in parallel a reconciliation bill, which only requires a majority. Recon a reconciliation bill only requires a majority. And it passes and the law is signed into place in 2010. But here's why it's, it, it's in my opinion, relevant for us. Well, it's certainly relevant for us because it's significant legislation because it's significant legislation that affects how we practice medicine, how we practice radiology. It has a, accountable care organizations. It has quite a few quality metrics. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're several years into that bill now, so we can re reflect on that. But, but what's particularly significant about it is the way that it passed. The Republicans to this day still resent the fact that the Affordable Care Act passed through a reconciliation process that once Scott Brown won that seat and the 59 votes were there, or no longer the 60 there, that the bill was allowed to go forward and be signed by the president. Which gets back to that, 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 that deep principle which I tried to describe earlier, which is if we have a circumstance where the majority can make that decision and the minority is willing to accept that decision, perhaps the outcomes are more favorable in general. I mean, it's, it's really difficult. It's, it's politically almost toxic times now. But as we think about those founding principles and we think about what the principles were in the past, maybe collectively, collectively we can 
become more accepting. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit now. And, and, and I want to take, talk about technology. Because I think within our profession, technology has is, is very much become sort of the great equalizer. But, 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 but in, in, in making these next statements, and I'm going to walk through some policies around um, not just technology, but within the context of uh, the public health emergency, within this context of this pandemic. It's, um, it's not especially fun to talk about something that's affected so many individuals at such a personal level, and everyone's story is different. And you know, what we've seen with these you know, four or five spikes that we've experienced is, is, is a very personal loss for many in this country, and certainly those in this virtual room, and, and those that have been kind enough to join, join me today. That said, at the peak of that crisis, you know, we, had no, we sort of had no choice but to respond. We had a responsibility to our members, we had a responsibility to physicians, we had a responsibility to public health, and we certainly, above all, had a responsibility to patients. So I'd like to sort of, I'm gonna walk through a series of policy events that occurred in the earliest days, but even to some degree continuing today, of the public health emergency. So again, come back in time with me, put that present lens to where I'm going. So let's go back to early 2000, the year, um, I'm sorry, early 2020, excuse me. And this, this, this virus is, 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 is coming. We know it's coming. Late January, Alex Azar declares a public health emergency. March, two months later, President Trump does the same, makes an emergency declaration for the United States. Here's why those two events are significant. Because the Social Security Act, which I described, and the law surrounding it, allows something called 1135 waivers. When the Secretary of Health and Human Services declares a public health emergency, when the President declares a national emergency, it triggers 1135 waivers. What the 1135 waivers are, they're part of the Social Security Act, they're section 1135. They basically give the Secretary of Health and Human Services the ability to do pretty much anything they want to help us get through a crisis, through an emergency. And so this is now kind of March, April time frame of 2020. We're, we're, we're asking ourselves, okay, what do we need to do? Well, there are a few pieces. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about the payment side, but I think those provider relief funds, most of us agree, were pretty significant. I wanna talk about it within the context of technology. Because at that time, with an unknown, mysterious, deadly virus on the horizon, we were seeing circumstances where the physician offices were struggling to see their patients. Where we were in a lockdown, staff were staying home, physicians were staying home, so it makes complete sense that what would we enable at that point in time? Telehealth, telemedicine. I sort of had the, the, the good fortune of being involved at this at a pretty deep level, at the AMA level, where we were telling the policymakers, we were telling CMS, we were saying, look, the physicians and patients are not able to gather in the same room. We need to advance these telemedicine, telehealth regulations pretty quickly through the 1135 waivers to allow that to occur. And those curves are dramatic. You know, in, in office visits dropping at the same time that telehealth, telemedicine visits are rising, particularly in the summer, particularly April, May timeframe. And we even were able to, and this took us through the interim final rule, to convince CMS to allow payment for audio only services. Because what we were hearing was that not all patients were savvy in what we, you know, we're all savvy in now, but at the time, you know, Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams or some of the interfaces we might use today to interface in a distance manner on a digital platform. And it wasn't just the seniors that were saying, it wasn't you know, those over 65 that were saying, I don't know how to use a computer. It was across all age groups because if you didn't do it before, you weren't necessarily going to make that pivot quickly in the middle of a crisis. So we got the audio only covered. You know, what this means to radiology is, is, is the following is, we saw those telemedicine, telehealth laws evolve, but we had already established rules and regulations around teleradiology. I had the privilege of chairing the task force in teleradiology in 2010 timeframe, plus or minus. So those rules, those technical standards, those practice guidelines, those billing patterns, the ability to collect for that, the fact that interpreting an x-ray is a face-to-face -face encounter, those were already in place because what we saw in the rest of medicine was the following, was, okay, doc, that's great, you're going to allow telemedicine to occur, that's great that you're going to lift geographic restrictions so patients can, can, can enable it. 
that's great that you're going to lessen supervision requirements to allow this to happen. But what's the, aside from provider relief funds, what's the other elephant in the room there? Is payment. So that was the big, through the 1135 waiver process, what we were able to achieve, which is salary parity between office-based E&M visits and teleradiology, telemedicine, and audio-only visits. So they're paid the same to sustain the offices where that was necessary. What it means for radiology is those patients are still getting imaging. We probably need to watch and evaluate how those policies evolve from a telemedicine perspective so we can contribute to how those patients are subsequently imaged and how that carries forth. It also applies to those subspecialties within radiology, radiation oncology, interventional radiology, um, women's imaging, where you see a lot of more what we think of as more traditional clinical care. Okay, so that, that's, that's where we were. I've already mentioned that the public health emergency requires that the secretary declare it, and it lasts for 90 days, 9-0, nine the three-month period. Last week, um, Xavier Becerra, the current Secretary of Health and Human Services, extended the public health emergency again, did it for the eighth time. So this is significant for a couple of reasons. One, it accelerated technology, telemedicine, telehealth, in a way that we may never see again for any specific policy that's meaningful. I mean, if we would just imagine for a moment that there hadn't been, and I wish this were the case, but imagine there hadn't been the public health emergency. To advance those telehealth, telemedicine regulations the way that we did within just a few months or a few weeks, it would have taken us years to accomplish. Now, we do need to responsibly evaluate what that means in retrospect. We need to look at the data, look at the experience, look at the outcomes, look at the role of radiology. I mean, there are some decisions we need to make regarding how we are going to inform an event which is, I think and I hope, someday going to occur, and that is the public health emergency ending. So imagine the president comes forth and says, we're no longer in a national emergency or the Secretary of Health and Human Services either fails to renew or ends the public health emergency. Well, those 1135 waivers disappear. They no longer apply because they're no longer the umbrella that allows them is no longer in place. So we need to think collectively how we are going to inform that decision making, those discussions, and those policy changes at that point in time. So let's talk about some history because again, there's, sort of, there's three pillars, if you will, to the advancement of artificial intelligence. And one of them is the development of, of algorithms. So this is um, a French mathematician named um, Adrien-Marie Legendre. 1805, looking at the stars, doing some astronomical calculations. He crafts a mathematical principle, which is key, which is the uh, least square method for regression. It's a pretty basic statistical principle. You know, it's, 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 it's necessary for most of what we think of today as sort of machine learning program, programming, you know, Python, backpropagation, et cetera. But he wrote that in 1805. So he sort of had the mathematical principles almost crafted in 1805. And then fast forward, in 1958, a physiologist scientist named uh, Frank Rosenblatt crafts an algorithm called Perceptron. And that was, that was the first, what we would think of today, was, they called it an artificial neural network at the time, but that was the first example of what we would think of today as being a, a convolutional neural network. At the same time, Arthur Samuel coins the term machine learning. So think about that for a moment. So all this excitement about artificial intelligence, which is relatively young within our field, our lives, our profession, most of the mathematical programming principles around that were available by the late 1950s at least in some basic form. So what are the other two pillars? Well, the second one is certainly computer power. Gordon Moore is one of the founders of, um, of Intel. And data scientists know the term, you know, Moore's Law. So he observed 1965, 1968 time frame, he observed that the number of transistors on a chip was doubling about every year. That's how fast the technology was evolving. You know, the first chip was probably Texas Instruments in 1958, plus or minus. That was sort of the first, what we think of as a modern microchip with multiple transistors. That technology has evolved, but, so that's how fast things is doubling every 12 months. Ended up being closer to 18 months, but you get the point. So the computer ability to process these huge swaths of computer programming and, and the third piece, which is the data, are maturing at this point. 
And the data is what? I mean, the data is what we do every day. I mean, I'm having a battle right now to keep individuals, even in my own audience here, off their phone to keep your attention because we have so much data which is being processed around us. It's digital. We as radiologists contribute to it because we have what? We have images. We have DICOM. We have images which are annotated. We have reports. So we're contributing to that piece, but it's what else? It's the World Wide Web. It's Google. Facebook. It's Twitter. It's these huge amounts of data in our phones, by the way. It's these huge amounts of data that are available for these computer programming, that are available for the computing power that we have, and then the ability for us to process it. This is a product it's called IDXDR. It's basically a product that screens patients for diabetic retinopathy. It's a camera, it's basically a, an ophthalmologic camera, looks at the retina, and determines whether there's anything significant as far as prediabetes retinopathy. April 2018, product goes before the FDA and it's approved. So there's sort of two different pathways if you're going to get FDA approval to market a product. One's the one we think about more traditionally, which is the 510K pathway, which is where you have a predicate device and you say, I have substantial equivalence, that's the term you'll hear them use, to that product to, to confirm that it's safe, that it's efficacious, that it can come to market. If, however, you don't have a predicate device, the second pathway is the de novo pathway. So why was IDXDR a de novo pathway? Why was IDXDR not compared to existing, in clinical practice, ophthalmologic cameras? Because the application came forth and was very forthright and said this is an autonomous product. The output of this product is autonomous. So let's think about, let's talk about what that term means when we say autonomous. Autonomous means a machine that has the ability to take data and based on prior training, machine learning algorithms, take new data, apply what it's learned, supervised or unsupervised, as a machine learning algorithm and produce an output. And it was, a, Viz AI was around the same time, but it was basically the first product to come that the clinical trials were exactly that. They were machine learning, deep learning, autonomous. And that's great, you know, that, that's, that's, that's fine. So it's, it's good, we're gonna learn from it, here we are. But something happens in May of 2019, the product comes before the CPT editorial panel. So the T CPT editorial panel, I, I mentioned earlier, I chair the RUC, so the RUC is, sort of the second step. That's we take codes that are created and we value them. That's what I do on this side, or we do at this side. The CPT actually creates the codes. They create the nomenclature. They create the descriptions. Most obviously my business managers, managers know coding very well because it's at the very core of what we do from a billing perspective. But it comes before the CPT editorial panel, this autonomous product. And the original descriptor for this product was blah, 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 autonomous blah, 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 blah. So they're acknowledging right off the top that this is a product which is engaged in a machine learning application for clinical care. So the autonomous piece goes before the panel. And the panel does what any smart decision-making group would do. They say, okay, we have a new term, it's autonomous. Let's look where we've used that term before in the CPT book. So my business managers, you know, feel free to open your book and look for the term autonomous. It's not there. It's never been used. It's never been used to describe a service for a code going forward in the CPT book. So what does the panel do? Understandably, they say, what terms do we have? Well, they have automated. There's automated, it's, it's, it's in a few different codes. It's, there, a lot of them are um, clinical pathology codes. But the term automated has been used. So they changed autonomous to automated and the product comes forward. Well, that's great, except now we've got more and more autonomous products, machine learning algorithms coming into clinical care. There's a few dozen, and it's, and it's growing. Because now we have a predicate device, now we can bring those products forward. So we're having to make a decision at the coding level how we are going to describe what the machines do. Earlier this year, and I had the privilege of being directly involved in this effort, the, uh, we created a taxon nomenclature for artificial intelligence to go into the CPT book. 
And there's a lot out there about nomenclature. I think the Consumer Technology Association does a great job. I thought the Duke Margolis effort was really pretty impressive as far as what the terminology and language would be. And obviously the ACR DSI is engaged in this effort. But we decided we, we were going to just try to assign sort of levels of artificial intelligence application within clinical care. And here's the three terms. I'm going to share them today. Um, I think we need to understand them as we watch technology evolve. One's assistive. So assistive would be basically um, an algorithm, makes a clinical determination, informs the physician, but that's pretty much all it does. I mean, it's not an exact comparison, but in our world that might be computer-assisted detection. The second one is augmentative. I'll repeat that term, augmentative. So an augmentative application actually makes an observation based on the algorithm, makes some determination of what that is, and presents it to the physician. Nothing else happens from a clinical level until the physician, until he or she makes a determination what to do with that. An example might be an algorithm that identifies a stroke, or it might be an algorithm that identifies a solitary pulmonary nodule. And we, as physicians, have to look at that and make a determination what the next step is. And then the third level is what I've already used, the term is autonomous, which is where the machine's making a ter determination but guiding clinical decision making, clinical care, therapeutic care, independent of a physician. An example might be algorithms that are around something, you know, sepsis determination, where you're in an ICU, you're looking at multiple clinical parameters, the algorithm is deciding what to do and it actually acts on it changes the ventilator setting, changes fluid, gives them medication. We don't generally see that as much, but what we are seeing, and what I think we want to or potentially need to think about within radiology is we're seeing artificial intelligence informing applications around therapeutics. The term you'll hear in the industry is digital therapeutics. The term you'll hear sort of from a CBT perspective is sort of remote therapeutic monitoring, where now you have an algorithm that's taking clinical data and without physician input is informing actions. So we're seeing that, and it's not just remote therapeutic monitoring, it's what's called remote therapeutic management, where it's not just monitoring a circumstance, but it's informing next steps in the treatment of that circumstance. So let's bring all this together. So I've talked a lot about a lot of topics, ending with, I ended with technology because the technology piece is sort of the great equalizer. Because now you've got the principles I described earlier where it's independence. You know, where are we going to be as these algorithms evolve from an independence perspective as radiologists, as physicians? Where else does the framework apply? Payment systems. Okay. I talked about the Affordable Care Act. I briefly mentioned the Medicare Access Chip Reauthorization Act. But as we see this move towards perhaps less independence of radiology as a service, but more part of a clinical pathway or part of a specific conditional management algorithm, or dare I say, employed by the hospital in making decisions in a vertically integrated network. So some of the same challenges we saw at the founding of our country, we saw with Medicare, we saw with the creation of TRGs, we saw with, I mean, we're seeing this at multiple levels in our profession, is we're in a circumstance where we're having to make decisions about what that independence is going to inform and where we're going to be, remembering what I said earlier, that we have an independence to, a responsibility to the independence of our country. We have a responsibility to the independence of our profession. And we have a responsibility to what we give the future generations. So that's going to be what we're going to do over the next two days. When you hear Barbara Rubel, you know, Claudia Murray, Ryan Lee, when you hear them talk about MACRA, MIPS, ACOs, alternative payment models, MIPS value pathways, you know, think about how we're going to evolve our role within radiology to accommodate those new paradigms. Okay, when you're Keith Chu and Leah Miroff reflecting on decisions from 10 years ago, were we right, were we wrong, that fits right in the wheelhouse of what I've described. When we think about the machines and we listen to the lectures we're going to hear this weekend about physician burnout, I mean, that's one of the quadruple aims. One, two, three, oh, by the way, number four is physician well-being, physician satisfaction, it's us. So let's think critically about how these decision points are being made. Let's think about these subjects, let's think about these topics. The organizers have given me the privilege 
of speaking at the closing of this meeting. So at that time, my plan is, and I've already talked to most of the faculty going into this meeting, I've had a chance, thank you for this time today, to sort of present some sort of foundational ideas and some, some directions for us to ponder. But at the close, I'm gonna to try to bring it all together. I don't know exactly what I'm going to hear from the faculty. I don't know what my, 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 um, my opinions may be, but they're probably pretty likely gonna be different. They're likely gonna be more informed, they're gonna be complimentary, we'll see. And we're gonna make those decisions together. So thank you for this time. Enjoy the virtual meeting. It's been an honor, and I'll see you, see you over the next few days. Thank you.